Um, so I'm going to talk about counterexamples in, in optimization, and this is a joint work with uh, Jérôme Bolt, who is also in the room. Um, before starting, a few words. So we will be working in R2. So it's, it's not a limitation, it's, it's actually a feature because we will consider negative results, so the more assumption, the stronger the result. Uh, throughout the presentation, k will be an integer uh, greater than 2, and it will represent a smoothness index. And we will be considering convex functions on R2 with compact sublevel sets and smooth, continuously differentiable up to uh, k. So k could be fixed right now, like 10 or 50, and it will be fixed throughout the presentation. So here is a motivating example. So this is the well-known uh, gradient descent algorithm. Here, the potential is convex. I suppose that it has Lipschitz gradient and that there exists a minimum. And so I use a constant step size, 1 over L. So this is very classical. Uh, we know that this will produce uh, uh, objective value which will converge toward the minimum. And furthermore, we know that the, the, um, the sequence will converge to uh, a, a solution. It will have a unique accumulation point. And so the argument is classical. It's phasure monotonicity. You get closer to each solution, and you can only accumulate two solutions. And from that, you get converged. Right. So that's a variant of the same algorithm. This is the exact line search variant. At each step, you perform a gradient step, but instead of choosing a fixed step size, you optimize on the ray, starting from the current iterate in direction minus gradient, and, and you, you, you minimize the objective value on, on this ray. And so legitimate question to ask about this one is, does it produce converging sequences? And so one of our contributions is uh, to provide an answer to that question, and it doesn't converge in, in general. Okay, so we have a counterexample in dimension two, which is convex CK. And the absence of convergence is not due to bad specification of the argmin here. Along the trajectory, the argmin is unique. Okay, so it's a, an intrinsic uh, uh, phenomenon. So how do we do that? Uh, the proof is constructive. We construct the, the pathological function f to be uh, convex and CK so that it has uh, oscillating gradients around the minimum. And so we use mainly two ideas. The first one is gradients will be orthogonal to, to level sets. So essentially, we'll be considering a sequence of level sets which will be oscillating in a way that we control. And then we would like to interpolate that sequence of level sets. So we will be uh, willing to build a function such that each, each of the level sets of that sequence will be a level set of the, the built function. So I'm going to review uh, uh, this problem. Uh, and, and actually, our main uh, abstract contribution is a solution to this, uh, to this problem in the smooth case. So this is a general tool. And now that we have built the general tool, we can construct many more pathological examples. And uh, so for all those examples, we will have convex CK potentials, which do not satisfy a certain property. So here are some examples. We have a counter example to Tom's gradient conjecture in the convex setting. So this relates to directional convergence of the gradient flow. Um, we have functions without error bounds. We have uh, Tikhonov regularization pass with infinite lengths, and we have a pathological Newton flow, so the continuous time version of the Newton algorithm. So those are interesting from a convex analysis perspective, but uh, maybe more interesting from a machine learning point of view are algorithmic counterexamples, and so those are the ones that I will discuss in more detail. So uh, Bregman gradient or mirror descent, we, we have uh, an example of mirror descent algorithm which does not produce converging sequences. And also another classic Frank Wolf algorithm, which does not produce uh, converging sequences. And so this last one is, is joint work with, with uh, Cyril Combet, who has a postdoc with us. And if you wonder, he is the son of Patrick Combet. <laughs> OK, um, so here is the plan. First, I will give an overview of the convex interpolation problem. And then I will present the solution that we propose to that problem. And then we will construct the examples that I talk about. So what is the convex interpolation problem? It's exactly what you would expect. I give you a sequence of, let's say, decreasing convex compact sets. I have this interiority condition, which, which is technical. It has to be satisfied by sublevel sets of convex functions outside the argmin. And then the question is, uh, is there a convex function such that those are sublevel sets of the, the, the convex function? Right, so this is an old question, and we had uh, early questioning in this, in this direction by Definetti and Fenkel in the 50s. And this was solved by Canet and Toralba independently. Uh, so essentially, their solution says that the convex function exists. Okay, so it exists. Uh, it's convex. It's only continuous. It's not smooth. Okay, so first, let's see how they did that. What, what, did, uh, what did they do, actually? 
So the idea is, is first interpolate between consecutive level sets. So we have a sequence, we are going to interpolate between consecutive level sets and then connect the interpolations. Okay, so let's interpolate between two sets. So T0 will be a sublevel set, we will associate it, uh, associate to it the value zero, so the function will have value zero on it, and T1 will be another uh, bigger set, and we will consider value F1 on this uh, uh, level set. And so what they do is, is, is a Minkowski average. Okay, so it's a set valued average, it's a Minkowski sum. Okay, so for each lambda between zero and F1, so between the, the two extreme values here, I will just do an average of, of the two sets. So this is a set valued average, it's, it's a Minkowski sum, and it works well with convexity, it preserves convexity in particular. So the, the, the average of, of convex set will be convex, this will be a convex set. That's how it looks like on the picture. Okay, so you have the outer set here, the inner set in the middle, and, and we interpolate using the, this Minkowski sum, and this looks like a legitimate slice of the graph of a convex function. Right, now let's connect those interpolations. So let's say I add uh, another set in the middle, I do the same and then I connect the interpolations. Then here, uh, you can guess from the picture that, that convexity is broken. Okay, so the, the, the slope do not really satisfy the convex uh, inequality, it doesn't work. And what, they, what Kanen Toralba proposed is essentially this, plus a clever choice of uh, the function values. So essentially they say that you can do that and choose the, the function values wisely so that conve uh, convexity is, is not broken. Okay, so that's their result. It works. Uh, we can build uh, convex functions in this way. Right, so what would be now the smooth convex interpola uh, interpolation problem? So we are interested in this one because we want to consider differentiable functions. Yes. No. Um, so there are quasi-convex functions which you, okay, so what, what we do here is uh, just a reparametrization of the values, right? So, so you, you take this one and you just reparametrize the value and it becomes convex, and you cannot do that for any quasi-convex function. So there are quasi-convex functions for which you can probably not reparametrize the, the, the values of the function, so you cannot compose with an increasing function so, so that it, it becomes convex. And the reason is uh, uh, like, yeah, curvature. Yeah, you, you have a, a second, second order impossibility. No. <laughs> um, okay. Um, what would be the smooth convex interpolation problem? It's exactly the same thing, except that in the end I want a smooth function. And in order to have a smooth function, I want, uh, I, I need to add this, this condition. Uh, uh, the, um, the boundary of my convex uh, sublevel set has to be CK. So it has to be a CK submanifold of R2. That's because that's a, a property of the boundary of sublevel sets of convex functions. Right, so that's the question. And here there is already a difficulty. Um, so what, what we try to do is to, to, to follow the same Minkowski average strategy. But in general, uh, Minkowski sum works well with convexity, but not really well with smoothness. Okay, so if, if, you, if you take two sets in, in RP, so in R2 it's more complicated, but in RP they could, be, uh, they could have C infinite boundary, but the sum is not C2. So that's a pathological situation, it's, it's, a, it's a weird phenomenon, uh, but this means that we need to take care uh, of this. Right. So let's see how we... we we deal with this issue, and so I need to talk a bit about positive curvature. So this is taken from the, 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 the Schneider book, which is a very nice book on, on convex analysis. Um, let's introduce the Gauss map. So if A is a compact convex set with non-empty interior, such that the boundary is C1. So that means the boundary is a C, C1 submanifold uh, in RP, and in our case P is 2, so it's just a, a C1 curve. Okay. Uh, then the Gauss map takes any input from the boundary and outputs uh, uh, the outer unit normal. Uh, and it turns out that this, this map is a diffeomorphism if and only if uh, the boundary is twice differentiable, not only C1 but C2, and it has positive curvature. And so this thing is denoted by C2+. plus. So since it's a diffeomorphism, then you have an inverse, and this inverse is called normal parametrization, so it goes from the sphere to the boundary, and actually, it has a very nice formula. It's related to the maximization problem for the support function. 
And so that's the normal parametrization. That's how it looks like on a picture. You go from the boundary to the sphere by taking the unit normal vector. And you could get back from the sphere to the boundary by getting the point where the normal is precisely the one that you had chosen in the first time. So why is that interesting? That's interesting because it brings uh, smoothness back. Okay, so if, if uh, as I mentioned, if you have two sets with smooth boundary, then the sum is, does not necessarily have smooth boundary. But if they have positive curvature, then the sum will also have positive curvature and, and uh, also CK uh, boundary. And so the reason is that this normal parametrization works well with sums. Okay, so that gives an explicit parametrization of the boundary of the sum, which you can use to show that it's, it's smooth. Okay, so that's positive curvature. Now no that we have positive curvature, I'm going to skip that one and try to give you an intuition of uh, what, we, what we propose. And the intuition can be understood in dimension one. It's related to Bézier curves. So Bézier was an engineer at Renault. He was drawing cards and he, and he, he, he hooked up this device to manipulate shapes. Uh, let's say I want to interpolate between those triangle points here. And I want to do it in a specific way. I want to first interpolate between uh, the first two ones and then the next two ones. And I want to connect the interpolations. And I want to do it in a way such that the connection is CK. So there are many ways to do that. And one way is, is the following. You, you add like support points here, those, those uh, circular points. And you build those um, uh, piecewise affine functions. Then you will be performing Bernstein interpolation, Bernstein approximation on those uh, uh, piecewise uh, functions. So Bernstein approximation is a polynomial approximation tool, and uh, it has very nice properties. And in particular, if you choose the degree of the approximation high enough, you will be controlling the value uh, uh, of the interpolation of, of the approximation at, at the boundary, the value of its derivative, and also the value of the higher order derivative. So uh, the the, the value will be the, given by the position of the point. The, the slope will be given by the slope that you choose here. And, and uh, I pay attention to choose the, 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 red, the circle point so that they are aligned with the triangle point. So you will control the slope, and it will be continuous. And then the higher order derivative will be vanishing up to a certain order. And so that's because if you do Bernstein uh, uh, approximation on a piecewise uh, uh, affine function for high degree, at the end point, the, the higher derivatives vanish. And so this is nice because we can do the interpolation independently and then connect it. So what we propose is very similar, but in dimension two. Okay, so that's uh, an, just an intuition. So the, I want to interpolate between those uh, uh, black lines, which represent level sets. I just take uh, uh, small homothetic copies of those level sets, they will play the role of the, the circular points, and then we built an interpolation which is similar to that. Okay, so this is just an intuition, this is very hand wavy, and I cannot give you much more details about it because uh, the actual construction is very computational. So I'm just sticking to the intuition. But doing that, we end up with a, a conic interpolation. So that's the main difference between what was done before and what we propose. The interpolation is conic, and the weights are computed by Bernstein approximation of certain piecewise affine positive function. So that's the main difference. And because of the construction, then we are able to, to perform interpolation between consecutive pairs of sublevel sets and connect those interpolations in a CK way. So that's the intuition. That's how it looks like on a picture. So you have uh, here three sets, and looking at the left picture, you can guess what those sets are. Okay, so you have the outer set, the intermediate set, and the middle set. So here you don't have smoothness, you don't have convexity. You do the brute force uh, Minkowski average that you connect, and it's not smooth and not convex. And by the strategy that we propose, this is the picture that we obtain. And you can see that in that picture, you, you, it's, it's difficult to, to, to see the, the intermediate set. And so that's because it's constructed so that, such that the connection is, is smooth. Right. So based on, on, on this idea, we have um, the following abstract result uh, regarding uh, a smooth convex interpolation. So essentially, it, brings, it gives a solution to the smooth convex interpolation problem under the additional assumption that the, the level sets that we consider have positive curvature. Okay, so that's the only thing that we, that we add. And based on the, the construction that I've shown before, it's possible to show that there exists a function f which has those level sets as a sublevel set. Right. 
Um, because we are in the positively curved uh, world, uh, actually we can have a bit more. It's possible to do the interpolation such that the Hessian of f is positive definite. So remember k is greater than 2, and the Hessian will be positive definite outside of the argmin. And so this, this will be useful in, in uh, the coming uh, sections. Uh, in particular, if the argmin is a singleton, then f is uh, strictly convex. Right. So this is very nice, but remember that our original goal was to construct f with oscillating gradients. And in order to do that, we need to provide this sequence of positively curved level sets with CK boundary. And even in R2, those are not really nice objects to work with computationally. Right? I mean, if you want to put the hands on this, those things exist, they are nice, but if you want to work with them really, uh, uh, we need a bit more. And so that's the question. How do you construct a, a, a C2 plus sets with uh, normals that you control? And so we have this um, auxiliary result, uh, which essentially says that you can work with polygonal uh, skeleton. So instead of working with, with the set itself, we'll consider polygons in R2. And at each vertex, we will choose a, a normal direction. So there is a small technical condition here that I, that I skip, but that, that works uh, for many possible choices. And, and it's possible to show that given this polygon and those normals, we can construct uh, an outer approximation, which will be C2 plus and CK, and which will have the chosen normals at, at, the, at the consider point. And furthermore, this approximation can be uh, up to arbitrary precision. So we can squeeze this uh, uh, arbitrarily close to the original set. So that's an auxiliary result, but if you combine this with the result above, then you, you, you get this practical counterexample construction tool, which is as follows. If, if I give you a sequence of polygonal uh, skeleton sequences that satisfy the interiority condition with a choice of normals at the vertices, then it's possible to show that there exists a CK convex function which interpolates uh, uh, whose level sets are close to the polynomial shape that you chose, and in particular, whose gradients are proportional to the arrows that you chose at, at the vertices of the polygon. OK? <laughs> Fine. Um, so now I'm not going to talk about uh, C2 plus sets anymore. I'm just going to show you polygons. OK, so we, we are going to, to, to get to the examples. Um, let's see. Yeah, OK. Um, so again, that's the exact line search variant of gradient descent. At each iteration, you optimize your um, uh, um, potential along the ray starting from xk in direction minus gradient. So if you look at that, uh, the optimality condition for, for, for this minimization problem is the following. At the next iterate, the gradient should be orthogonal to, to the, the line from current iterate to next iterate. And this allows to control uh, what happens and to construct the, the pathological behavior. OK, so on the left, you have gray lines here, which represent the polygonal skeleton. OK, so we have a sequence of polygons. All those polygons are somehow like rotation of, of this one, like quarter uh, turn rotation. And the dotted line represents uh, the, the sequence of exact uh, line search gradient descent. So what is happening here? So let's look at this polygon. Let's say um, my sequence is coming from above, and I'm, I'm minimizing my, my, my potential along the, the vertical uh, line here. Then the only possibility is to stop at that point, because this is where the gradient will be orthogonal to the direction. And uh, this will be the only point where this happens, because my Hessian will be positive definite, so I will have like strict convexity along the line. Okay, so I can do nothing but stop here, no matter what the, the norm of the gradient here. Then I compute the gradient there, and I perform a gradient step, and I will be working along the horizontal axis. Okay, and so I will, I will stop somewhere, and the construction here essentially is made such that the next uh, point where I stop is, is, is on a, a polygon which is similar to this one, but rotated by a quarter turn. So I stop here, and I, it's possible to repeat the, this uh, uh, until infinity in such a way that those almost square shapes will accumulate on, on a, a non-degenerate square. So you need to work a bit more in order to show that the, the, you have room to accumulate along the square, but, but that's what happens. Yes? Oh, yeah, sure. So this is a precise initialization. Okay, so it's, it's a, for that function, 
very probably most initialization uh, would, uh, would not produce this by behavior. It's a very worst case scenario. We will have some examples for which we have less dependence on the initialization, but for this one we do. Yes? Uh, no, no, no. The, it's, the, the whole argument is this, but along each ray you have a unique minimizer. No, the argmin is the square. Okay, otherwise it would converge to the, uh, to the unique minimum. So the argmin is the square, okay? So in, what, what I didn't mention is, in this thing, the argmin is the inter in intersection of all the, the sets, and, and so the intersection of all the sets here will be the, the square. Uh, so it, it doesn't have a unique minimum. Right. Um, so let's, let's move on. Uh, if you look at this example, actually, this is also a valid counterexample for the convergence of the alternating minimization uh, uh, algorithm. So at each iteration, you will fix one coordinate minimized with respect to the other, and it would behave exactly the same. Let's say I'm minimizing uh, along the, the y-axis first, I will stop here, then minimizing along the x-axis, I will stop here and, and, and produce the same. So actually the same function would produce a, a non-convergent behavior for, for the, the ghost side of the algorithm. Okay. Um, so let's, let's uh, see another example. So this is uh, mirror descent. Um, I'm not going to describe the, the most uh, uh, general version of this algorithm. I'm just going to describe a simplified version, which, which is good enough for my purpose. So I'm considering a linear program over a compact convex set. Okay, so I'm maximizing a linear function. It could be much more general, but that, that's enough for me. OK, so one, one, uh, one possibility, one, there are many ways to solve this, but one way is the following. Uh, we could pick a, a Legendre function on, on H. So what is a Legendre function? If you studied uh, uh, non-Euclidean variations of the gradient algorithm, then you're aware of Legendre functions, but let's, let's recall. Um, a function H will be Legendre if, if it's, uh, so it needs to be convex. Uh, it will be essentially smooth on the interior of, of the domain C which means that it should be differentiable and that the, the, um, the gradient will explode when you get close to the boundary. Okay, so that's essential smoothness. And it has also to be strictly convex on the interior of C, meaning that the, the, this convexity inequality has to be strict for x different from y. Okay, so that's Legendre function. And if you have such a function, then uh, Rocafellar says that, I mean, you can find it in his book, uh, it will be mapping the interior of C to R2, and the mapping will be a homeomorphism, meaning that it's invertible, it's continuous invertible, and it's a, it has a continuous inverse. And furthermore, you can actually compute the inverse. It will be the gradient of the conjugate function, and the conjugate function itself will be Legendre. So it's, it's a dual, uh, dual pro, prim, primal dual property. Let's say. Right, so now that we have those objects, the mirror descent algorithm goes as follows, and you already saw that yesterday, and actually you saw this exact same picture. You start from a point in, in, the, in the interior of the set, you go to R2 with the gradient mapping, perform a gradient step, and then get back to the original set. Right, so what is known about, the algorithm, about this algorithm? A lot is known. Uh, let me just recall uh, a few results. It's known that this will have a, a 1 over k uh, suboptimality gap. So this is uh, Boschke and colleague, uh, 2017. Very similar to the, actually to the gradient descent algorithm. And so a legitimate question now is about its uh, sequential convergence, right? The, the gradient descent algorithm produces convergent sequences. Does this produce convergent sequences? And the answer is uh, actually yes, under additional restriction on, on the function h. Essentially, you need, to, you need that, yeah, the topology encoded by, by the, the divergence here has to be compatible with the Euclidean topology. So this is a somehow ad hoc assumption. But in general, the answer is no. So if you don't make any additional assumption, then you will, you will, not have, uh, uh, you will possibly not have convergence. OK, so let's see how, how it looks like. So th that's the. That's the algorithm. I, I'm just reformulating it. Um, so let's, let's take the gradient uh, on both sides. Uh, this simplifies like this. And because C, the gradient of the objective function, is a constant, then I end up with this closed formula, closed form formula for the, for, for the, the expression of the current iterate. Or actually, the, the expression of the gradient of the current iterate. 
And if I initialize uh, at the argmin uh, of h, then this term will be vanishing, and I, I, I get this nice expression for, for xk. Okay, so that's a closed form expression. It's specific to the fact that I choose a linear uh, objective here. Right, so what do we need to do? We need to construct h star such that uh, it should be Legendre, h will be Legendre, and it should have oscillating gradient here. Okay, so let's try to build a skeleton for h star. Those are the constraints that we need to satisfy. h should be Legendre, and its domain should be bounded. That, that was the, the, the domain of h will be included in the compact set that we had before, so it should have a bounded domain. So what that means is that h star should be CK, okay, so CK because we, we are looking at uh, smooth examples, strictly convex, and it should be Lipschitz. That's because H should have bounded domain. Okay, so uh, we have mentioned strict convexity and smoothness. This is okay. We can deal with it with the, the general result, but this is an additional assumption, an additional restriction that we need to, to, um, to consider. Okay, so those are the, this is the polygonal sequence of uh, uh, skeleton that we chose. Um, those are essentially sublevel sets of the L1 norm. And the, the rows that we choose at, at vertices will be oscillating uh, uh, in that direction. Okay, so this is the, the direction which, which we will choose here. Right, so our general result says that uh, H star will be uh, uh, smooth. It will have a positive definite Hessian outside of its argmin. And actually, it's possible to interpolate here such that the argmin is a singleton. And so in that case, H star will be strictly convex. So we have strict convexity, we have smoothness. We don't have Lipschicity. So where does Lipschicity come from here? It comes from the fact that those sublevel sets are homothetic copies, uh, uh, one, of, uh, one of the other. So I did not pick any, any polygon here. The fact that they are uh, essentially sublevel sets of the L1 norm allows to interpolate with, with a, a Lipschitz function. Right, so because of this property, we have additional properties of, of, for the function h star, it's Lipschitz, and also in addition, it's possible to show that the, the, the conjugate h will be Legendre, and which it will have a compact domain, meaning essentially it will be continuous on its domain. Right, and so uh, now that you have this, uh, uh, um, this function with oscillating gradients here, then Essentially, it shows that the sequence does not converge because you have a closed form expression which relates to the, precisely to the gradient at, at those points. Right, so that's uh, a negative result regarding uh, mirror descent or Bregman gradient, and it's possibly related to uh, another phenomenon. There is a very nice contribution by Dragomir and colleagues in 2020. They show that it's not possible to accelerate uh, uh, the, the, the Bregman uh, gradient algorithm. Okay, so there are no, no, no acceleration in general. And I mean, this is another example of things that is not possible. Conver you have no convergence in general, and maybe those two things are related. Yes? Yes, yes, yes. OK, so um, essentially, the, so here, the, 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 the domain of the, of, the func of, the, of the function h will be the unit square, and you will be converging to the the face, the which, which is the argmin. OK. Um, and so let's move to our last example, another uh, uh, classic algorithm. And again, uh, this one is joint work with uh, Cyril Combet. Um, and I'm, uh, again, describing a specific version of this and not the most general one, because it's good enough for my purpose. So f will be uh, convex with Lipschitz gradient. And C will be um, uh, a compact convex set. And so the algorithm goes as follows. At each iteration, I'm performing a convex combination between the current iterate and a certain VK. VK will be solving uh, uh, a linear program on, on, the, on the constraint set. So you will be picking up the, the extreme point, which correlates the most negatively with, with, with the gradient. And then you will perform uh, an average here. And one way to choose the, uh, the, the, the weight here is to minimize these quadratic upper bounds. So L will be a Lipschitz constant of the gradient. Uh, so if you mi minimize this quadratic upper bound on the, se the, the segment, so from xk to vk, then that's a legi legitimate choice of uh, step size. Okay, so that's one va va variation of the algorithm. That's how it looks like on the picture. The gradient here is pointing to the top right corner, you will be picking up the bottom left corner of the constraint set, the box here, and then just do an average. 
Okay, so there is, this is a very classical in optimization and machine learning, and uh, there is a, a lot which is known about it. So let's, let's mention a few, uh, a few facts. Uh, first, the, um, the fixed points of this vari variant of the algorithm will be uh, the minimizers of my, my, my convex objective over my compact set. It also has a, a 1 over k uh, optimality gap. I described a, a specific step size uh, variant of the algorithm, but there are many more possibilities. And yeah, the question that we ask is a sequential convergence. Again, it's a variation of the gradient algorithm. The gradient algorithm converges. Does this, was, uh, this one uh, converge? And of course, again, the answer is no. In general, it doesn't converge. So let's see the, the, the polygonal skeleton here. And maybe I, I should mention that the difficulty in that example stems from the fact that um, it's not enough to control the direction of the gradients because uh, the step size will depend on, on the function. It does not just depend on the direction, it depends on the function. So if you want to control things, you need to be a bit uh, more precise here. Right, so those sublevel sets will go uh, in pairs. Um, and O here will be the origin. So remember, we are doing, we are doing a conic interpolation. So we need to fix a, an origin for the cone, and it will be that one. And we chose, uh, we chose um, the, the level sets so, such that there is a, a specific alignment. So um, those vertices should be aligned with the origin. And the arrows that we choose at the vertices should be, uh, so those two ones are parallel and those two ones are parallel. So it's possible to, to, to choose them in this way. The, the two arrows are, are, are slightly different. This one is slightly different from this one, but those are parallel and those are parallel. And then we, we repeat this construction uh, in a dyadic fashion by um, just dividing the, the height by zero, for example. Right, so what's happening here? First, um, we have a lot of alignment. And so this, this alignment allows to control the gradient direction, not only at the, at the vertex uh, points, but uh, on the, the whole segments here and the whole segments here. Right, so that's because we chose those arrows to be parallel and, this, uh, and those vertices to be aligned with, with the origin. So the direction of the gradient will be uh, given by the arrow here on the whole segment here. And uh, as a consequence, actually, we control the, the output of the linear oracle on this whole parallelogram there, right? Because uh, on this parallelogram, the gradient will be pointing slightly to the right. And so the, the, the linear oracle has to give uh, this point here. And this goes similarly below uh, on, on the parallelogram that we have, so except that we, we reversed, so it's, it's symmetric. Uh, uh, the, the linear oracle will be pointing to, will be choosing that point here. Okay, so that's a way to control uh, uh, um, uh, the output of the linear oracle on a significant part, sorry, of, of, the, of, of the overall volume. And so with this construction, it's possible to show that if the step size satisfies the following, so it has to go to zero, it has to be smaller than one strictly and not summable. Okay, so in particular, it happens for the, the specific step size that we have here, if you slightly overestimate L. So if I have the exact L, maybe I cannot guarantee this, but if L is slightly overestimated, then it works. And, uh, and the sequence will not converge. And the reason why it doesn't converge is that because in, in the process of crossing those uh, three areas here, you have to be traveling either to the right or to the left by a significant amount. So either here you need to travel to the left or here to the right or in the middle, you need to travel to the left or to the right. And, and the, the amount of travel that you need to do is, is fixed. It's, it's uh, lower bounded by a, by a constant, which is non-zero. Okay, so that's uh, the non-convergence mechanism. Okay, um, so it was faster than expected. <laughs> uh, let me conclude. Um, so we provide a general a smooth convex uh, interpolation result in R2. So that's our main um, uh, uh, abstract result. Um, the only thing that we require is positive curvature of the level set that we need to interpolate for the reason that uh, this is required to preserve a, a, a smoothness of the boundary when dealing with Minkowski sums. And we specify those positively curved sets with a polygonal skeleton. So this is a, a general tool that you can use to build nasty convex functions. Um, what I did not detail in the presentation were additional counterexamples and uh, also computational aspects of the, of the construction. So as I mentioned, the construction is 
very computational. I only showed you pictures, but uh, the overall thing is mostly about uh, differential calculus, computing derivatives, etc. Um, and possible extensions uh, are the following. So we could consider more counterexamples. We could consider C infinite interpolation. So we have CK for an arbitrary K fixed, and it would be nice to go to C infinity for the moment we don't know. And maybe more technical, but interesting from a theoretical perspective, relax the positive curvature assumption, because that would um, lead, according to me, to a completely different technique. Right, so with this, I stop, and I thank you for listening, and I'm a bit... <laughs>